So if you'd like to turn to um, Joshua chapter 5, and uh, going through to, to chapter 6, page 220 in the Church Bible. <coughs> As we know, the, the chapter and verse divisions in the Bibles are not um, inspired by God, and whoever came up with the division at chapter 6 verse 1 was distinctly uninspired um, because really chapter 6 should begin at verse 13 of chapter 5 um, that's where it begins an armed man appears before Joshua and as I suspect most of us wouldn't do Joshua goes and confronts him this man is armed drawn sword and Joshua is really quite extraordinarily brave. Goes up to this man and he confronts this stranger uh, with a question. He says, verse 13, are you for us or for our enemies? He confronts this stranger and the stranger doesn't answer the question. But instead, the stranger tells Joshua who he is who he is he says neither but as commander of the army of the lord i have now come this man is neither friend nor foe he is neither for the israelites nor for their enemies he is over them both he is over them both he is altogether different he is the commander of the lord's army and Joshua falls down in reverence. Now commentators disagree as to whether this stranger is an angel or Christ. <coughs> well, for me, this is unquestionably Christ. It's Jesus. In the NIV, it's, this, it's translated that Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence. In other translations, most translations, it's described as worship. Joshua worships. And you compare Joshua's response to this man, to the response of Peter and John in the book of Acts, where they worship Peter and John, and Peter and John say, no, 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 we're, we're men. You, you don't worship us, we're men. This stranger accepts Joshua's worship. Compare to the, to the shepherds who met with the angels or the angels met with the shepherds out on the hillsides the shepherds didn't worship no these are angels but by contrast joshua worships he falls face down and he worships this figure who is in front of him this man is divine he is christ and he says you are on holy ground why because it is christ in chapter 6 and verse 2 we read the Lord said to Joshua the word Lord there written in capital letters denoting the name of God it is Christ who meets with Joshua and so the tables are turned Joshua confronting this stranger is suddenly aware of who it is he's standing in front of and he no longer wants a fight He's suddenly on the back foot and he responds with worship. And also a question. What message does my Lord have for his servant? He worships and then asks, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And instead of challenging this stranger, instead he asks, how can I serve you? What do you want me to do and the answer that Jesus gives him is take Jericho take Jericho chapter 6 verse 2 I have delivered Jericho into your hands take Jericho and the fall of Jericho is what we're going to be looking at this evening under three headings there we go God's presence God's power God's purpose, God's presence, God's power, God's purpose. 
So first of all, let's look at God's presence. God's presence. The inhabitants of Jericho were frightened, frightened because of the people of Israel and the gates to the city, we're told, were shut. And so they sat there, the people of Jericho, inside the city, secure behind these great walls. And the people of Israel, who had to take the city, if they were to take the land that God had given them, well, they sat in the fields outside Jericho. People of Jericho inside, the people of Israel outside. A Mexican standoff, you might call it. Chapter 6, verse 1. The gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in. No one came out. And it's into this situation, this standoff, that God speaks. The Lord speaks in verses 2 to, to 5. The commander of the Lord's army outlines to Joshua this strange battle plan. Very, very precise instructions, but strange instructions. Take the Ark of the Covenant, armed men and priests, march around the city once for six days, and then on day seven, march around seven times, get the priests to blow the horns, shout, and the walls will collapse, and you'll march in. Strange instructions, but very, very specific. And what these instructions tell us is that the Lord was saying to his people, Christ was saying to his people, I am with you. I am present. How do we know that? Because of the number seven. The number seven? The number seven is important, vitally important. For seven days, they were to march round the city. Seven times on day seven, they were to march round. Seven priests were to blow seven trumpets. Victory would be achieved on the seventh day. The number seven, again and again and again in this story. And the number seven, scholars will tell us, is significant. It's a symbolic number in the Bible, and it stands for God's completed work, the action of God, the completed, finished work of God. So in Genesis, for example, we have seven days of creation. God rests on the seventh day. Go all the way through to the book of Revelation. There are 55 sevens in the book of Revelation. 55, seven churches, seven lampstands, and so on. The number, number seven, symbolic of God's presence. And the repetition of seven here in the instructions that God gives to, to Joshua, tell Joshua, and they tell the people that God is with them. God is with them. He is present. But even more importantly than that, we see the presence of God in the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box that contained, amongst other things, the two, the two tablets that formed the Ten Commandments that God had given to the people of Israel. And that Ark was, again, symbolic of God's presence with his people. Now, God is everywhere. God is everywhere all the time. But God had said, here, above the ark, this is where I shall be specially for you. So it was again symbolic of God's presence. And the prominence of the ark in this story indicates to, to Joshua and to the people that God is present with them. He's present. Now last year, you'll remember, I'm sure, the king's coronation and that fantastic procession that, that went from Westminster Abbey to, to Buckingham Palace after the coronation itself. One and a half miles long, nearly, the procession from front to back. But of course, the center of it, the, the focus of it, was the king. It was all about him. The whole one and a half miles of it was all really just focused on King Charles. Well, just as the focus was on the king then, so our focus really in chapter six should be on the ark, the ark of the Lord. Yes, there was an armed guard. Yes, there were priests and trumpets. 
but the focus is on the ark and, and and our attention is drawn to it again and again in in the passage but particularly look at verse 11 joshua had the ark of the lord carried around the city circling it once it was the ark that was going around yes there was a great procession with it but the focus is on the ark the lord was laying siege to the city god was laying siege to jericho and so we have the presence of the lord in the in the number seven in the ark god is present well now for us it is so much clearer isn't it now god is present with us for us in christ god is present with us his people in jesus that's what we celebrate at christmas isn't it we celebrate the coming of emmanuel god with us and christ is god he is god john 15 jesus says i am in the father and the father is in me i am god and just as god was so wonderfully and reassuringly present with his people at jericho so jesus christ is wonderfully and reassuringly present with us his people his church so when we serve him he says behold i am with you always when we are anxious he says do not let your hearts be troubled when we feel alone he says i will not leave you as orphans when we have sinned he says neither do i condemn you go and sin no more in christ god is with us god is present now we often pray don't we lord be with so and so lord be with me in this situation that i find myself in and this is what we mean isn't it when we pray these things lord be with them lord be present with them in such a way that they know lord be with me in such a way that i actually am aware of your presence with me lord be present with me be present with them may i know it may i understand it do we know that god is with us do we know it we should because he is in jesus christ he is emmanuel no matter what our circumstances no matter what may come god is with us he is present surely present with us in jesus christ first of all then god's presence with joshua and the people of israel in the ark with us today in christ secondly let's look at god's power god's power at jericho the people of jericho were frightened of the people of israel and so they locked the gates they locked the doors they locked themselves away it would have been absolutely impossible for the people of israel to take the city and yet that's exactly what jesus promises doesn't he chapter cha chapter 6 verse 2 i have delivered jericho into your hands jesus promises victory i have delivered it's a done deal it's as if it's already happened i have delivered the city for you christ promises his people victory and what's more he promises them complete victory i have delivered jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men so the city the king the army all delivered it will be yours says jesus and all this emphasizes the fact that the taking of Jericho would be completely the work of God, completely done by the power of God. It's his action. And if you think about it, it has to be by his action. It has to be. I mean, how does a nomadic people, not even a building to their name, take a fortified city? They don't have siege guns. They don't have catapults, those huge boulder slinging contraptions. They don't have 
scaling towers to climb up and, and uh, cross, cross the ramparts? Impossible, impossible. It might well have been an impressive convoy that went round the city, the, the army, the, the ark, the priests and, and so on. It might have been impressive to look at, but it's, it's not gonna take a city. And yes, the priests might be blowing the horns and that might have been frightening to the people of Jericho. Like the Vuvu Zaylers, do you remember them at the South African World Cup? Absolute racket that they made. Yeah, they, they might have been a bit perturbed, but it doesn't make the walls fall down, does it? No, it has to be God. It has to be God. It has to be God giving victory to the people of Israel. Look at the promise in verse 5. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, says the Lord, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. That's the instruction. Verse 20, look at the fulfillment. Verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. It's just as God said, just as God said it would happen. This is the action and the power of God at work. And the word for collapse here, the walls will collapse. The word here means actually kind of under itself. The wall collapses under itself. It's a, if you can imagine those um, pictures of the demolitions of huge towers, or huge buildings where all the explosive is laid at the bottom and, and the whole building just collapses on itself. That's the image that, that we're given here, the collapse, complete collapse of these walls. And it is complete, it's the whole wall. It's not a breach here or there. Not like the police knocking down the, the door of a criminal and they pour in through the, through the opening. No, this is the complete collapse of the whole of the wall around the city of Jericho, just as God promised in verse two, I have delivered Jericho into your hand. I have done it. This is God at work. This is the power of God that secures this victory to the people of Israel. Now, I wonder if we believe that God is with us in the same way. I wonder if we believe that God's power is at work for us in the same way today. Well, it is. It is. And perhaps to help us understand how that is, it would be helpful to understand the significance of Jericho as a city. Because Jericho wasn't just the first great city in the land that the people of Israel were to take. It wasn't just because it was the first place they came to after they crossed the River Jordan. That wasn't its primary significance. It was also significant because the word Jericho means city of the moon god. City of the moon god. And Jericho was a center for pagan worship. The pagan worship of the moon god. God. And the significance, therefore, of the taking of Jericho is not just in its strategic significance in terms of conquering the land, but also a demonstration that God wasn't just giving them, wasn't just defeating the people, he was defeating their gods as well. The gods of the Canaanites, the gods of the pagans would fall before God. He was destroying not just the city, but the religion too. Turn to Matthew um, chapter 16, and we'll see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew 16 and verse 15. Jesus asks Simon Peter, what about you? He says, what, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. So just as the commander of the Lord's army promised to give Jericho into the hands of his people, so Jesus promises to build his church. And do you see the parallel? The gates of Jericho barred, secured, the people shut in, locked in. Similarly, the gates of hell are securely barred, holding men and women prisoner, keeping them in chains, but God breaks them down. Just as the walls of Jericho fall, so Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. They will, break, they will fall down, they will break down. Those gates will not prevail. And Christ will build his church. And Christ will rescue those who are being saved. And that is the power of God at work today in the church. Just as it was for Joshua, so it is for us. And Jesus declares in the Great Commission, doesn't he? He says, all authority... In heaven, on earth, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Why? Because he has authority. Why? Because he is breaking down the gates of hell. How? Because of his power at work for the church. All authority has been given to him. Do we believe it? Do we believe it? Do we believe that he is still the commander of the Lord's army? Perhaps we do. Perhaps we do. But perhaps also we feel weak. And perhaps also we feel tired. And perhaps also we feel as though we are lacking in resources. And when we do, when we do, that's when we need to remember that it's not about our power. It's about his it's about the power of God. Remember, it is God who took a whole city simply by having his people walk round it. It's God who is our commander. It is Jesus who is the commander of the Lord's army. Remember, the power of God at work for us. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, so, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, he says, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul knew it wasn't about his power. And he was confident. And Joshua knew it wasn't about his power. And he was confident too. And we should know that it's not about our power. And we should also be confident. Let us trust in the promise of our commander. I will build my church. And let us be confident. Let us trust in the power of Jesus Christ to fulfill that promise, to build his church. Not because we have the resources, but because he does. Let us trust in the power of God to build his church. Thirdly, and finally, let's think about God's purpose, God's purpose. What is God teaching us here? Well, when we read the story of the Battle of Jericho and lots of other Old Testament stories, the temptation when we read them is to make the story about us, to make it about me and, and you. Think of the most 
one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament, David and Goliath. We know the story. Goliath, the giant, challenges the people of Israel, challenges the army and says, send someone out to fight me. This enormous man challenges the whole army of Israel and the people and the army of Israel, the army of Israel is frightened. I'll pay for that later. Um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> it seems to be broken. Um, yeah, the, the, the army of Israel is, is frightened. They, they, they don't send anyone, anyone out. They can't. And so what happens? God sends a rescuer. God sends someone. God sends a saviour. The weak boy, David, who with a handful of stones and a sling, defeats Goliath, cuts off his head. How? It's impossible. Because God is with him. It's God who saves Israel. God <laughs> defeats Goliath. And the point of the story is not with God on, our, on your side, you can defeat the giants in your life. Whatever the problems in front of you, with God on your side, you can defeat them. No, not at all. The point is the reverse. The point is that we need a saviour because we can't. We cannot defeat Goliath. We need God to do it for us. The, the story of David and Goliath is not about our victory. It's about God's victory for us, God's rescue of us. And it's the same with Jericho. It's the same with Jericho. It's not about you and me. It's about God. It's not if you obey God, you will defeat your enemies. It's not if you have faith in God, you will have success. No, that makes the story about us. And the story of Jericho is about God. The story of Jericho ultimately is about God's salvation. And salvation is God's purpose. And we see it in Rahab. We see it in Rahab. Rahab is actually the whole point of the story. It's Rahab who is the, not the hero, but the focus, the focus of the story here. It's Rahab. It's not about victory, our victory. That's not the point. How we win in our battles against the giants of our lives. No, it's about Rahab. It's about salvation. Think about Rahab. Think about her. She cannot possibly save herself. She cannot possibly save herself. She's a pagan. She's a pagan. She's under the judgment of God. She's a prostitute. We're not spared the, the, the details of her profession. There's no hiding of it, no glossing over it. She lives in a city that's doomed to destruction. Its people are going to be slaughtered. Its buildings are going to be burned. And against all of these odds, against all of this, Rahab is saved, rescued. Now what saves her? It's not her character, it's not her good deeds, it's not her worthiness. No, she simply has faith in the God of Israel. We read about it in chapter two of Joshua. How Joshua sends out spies and Rahab in Jericho takes them in. She puts her trust in God. She sides with the God of Israel and she alone therefore is saved. She hides the spies and is saved. Chapter 6, verse 17. Joshua says, The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies that we sent. And this really is the story of Jericho, how Rahab is saved, saved from the complete destruction of Jericho, Rahab saved, and how Rahab is brought out of Jericho and placed into the very family of God. Verse 25, Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with all her family and all who belonged to her, 
because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Rahab is taken from paganism and brought into the family of God. She lives not in Jericho, but with the family of God. She lives with the Israelites. She's saved. And remarkably, as we read the book of Ruth, and as we read Matthew, remarkably, this woman is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Christ descended, humanly speaking, from this woman, Rahab. She's saved. And we can be saved too. We can be saved too. And like Rahab, we need to be saved. We need to be saved because we cannot save ourselves. We cannot. Like Rahab, we need to be saved. Like Rahab, we have nothing that we can bring God. Nothing. Nothing. We, have, we had no interest in God. We perhaps have no interest in God. We need to be rescued. We need him to break into our lives. Our lives were, are completely compromised by what we have done and said and thought. Like Rahab. By nature, we are sinners. We live in a world where men and women reject God, a world that is doomed to destruction like Jericho was. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, Peter writes this, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Now, it sounds an awful lot like Jericho, doesn't it? The whole world is under the same judgment of God. But just as God's purpose then was salvation, to save Rahab out of the ruins of Jericho, out of the ruins of her life, so God's purpose today is to save us, to save you and me. Salvation is God's purpose. Then... In the miraculous defeat of Jericho, today, through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. The miraculous rescue of Christ for us. God sends his son into the wreckage and ruins of this world to die on a cross to save us and rescue us. <laughs> and so just as Rahab turned her back, on her old way of life, her old people, and instead turned to God and put her faith in the God of Israel and was saved. So we too need to do the same. Turn our backs on our old way of life to repent and turn to God in Jesus Christ and be saved. This is God's purpose. This really, is the story of Jericho. It's about salvation. It's about rescue. So, we've been looking at the fall of Jericho. We've seen how God was present with his people through the symbolism of the number seven, through the Ark of the Covenant. Then, now, we see how God is present with us through Jesus Christ. We've seen how God's power is at work. Then, in the defeat of Jericho itself, the falling of the walls, now we see it as Christ builds his, builds his church. And we've seen God's purpose, salvation. Then, for Rahab. Now, for us, as we repent and turn in faith to Christ. So God's presence, God's power, God's purpose. Then, for Joshua and the people of Israel, now, today, for us, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's sing as we close. Our final, uh, our final song, O Church, Arise.